Uh, yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. We, uh, we are going to do some more worship at the end of the message, simply because I think after we look at this passage of Scripture, uh, Romans chapter 6, we're going to have more reason to celebrate than when you came in. Um, as if coming in wasn't celebration enough. Uh, so we uh, kind of split things up a little bit. This is our tenth week uh, in our journey through Romans. Um, I don't know if for you it's gone by fast or not, but uh, we are. this is our 10th week as we have been journeying through this book. So I want to give a quick little review of kind of where we've been uh, and uh, catch everyone up to where we're going. So if we remember the very first week, Paul introduced himself as a saint. He was one who was called, he was a, uh, one who was set apart, and he really gave us the challenge that every believer has a call in their lives to be set apart from the world. And then that we are set apart for the sake of the gospel. Uh, Romans 1, 16 to 17, that this is the message or the truth about Jesus, that we are created in the image of God. And that we have, uh, however, we are fallen and no longer carry that image. And through Christ, God seeks to redeem us, uh, to, to forgive us, to, to conform us back to that image, to transform us back into the original image in which we were created. Paul spent that next major section of his letter laying out really the predicament that we find ourselves in. And that man is sinful. And that God is justified in punishing man's sinfulness. And, and that we really have no hope outside of uh, or within ourselves uh, to create uh, a solution to the problem. And that men are without excuse. And, and it was kind of tough those weeks to kind of just trudge through uh, this sin issue. But Paul spent so much time on it that we needed to spend time on it too. That we understand the importance of sin. That we understand the importance that God places upon the, the, the fallenness of man. Because until we understand the, the true uh, depravity, we can really not truly understand and appreciate the grace and the forgiveness that God extends to us. And so we have found ourselves in a hopeless situation uh, if it were not for the hope that Christ brings through the cross. That God had a plan all along to redeem man. And that that hope is, is a new righteousness that, that he reveals. Uh, a right standing that comes from God through faith. And we had that il great illustration through the life of Abraham. Uh, that, that Abraham was, was faithful and it was counted to him as righteousness. It was put to his account because of his faith. And that God will justify, God will make right the person who puts faith in his son. And that there are incredible blessings that come with being justified by God. Last week we looked at how, how God does that. How God takes a, a sinful person and, and makes them righteous. How he puts uh, the, the sin that is ours because of Adam and how he is willing to put the righteousness of Christ to our account. That, that taking the, the sin that is on us and covering it with the righteousness of Christ. And that without that covering we remain in our own sin. And that, 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 that sin leads to physical death, leads to spiritual death. But with the covering, we are free. Free to truly live now and the promise of living for eternity. And that's where we are this morning. We're, we're standing on the brink of that promise. That, that Paul is starting a new section to his letter. And chapter 6 starts what is referred to as the sanctification section. And sanctification is really just that big church word that everyone's afraid of, that just means the process of being made holy. If something is sanctified, it has been set apart. It, it, has, been, it has been made holy by God and set apart for His use. So Paul is saying that crossing that line of faith, stepping into a loving forgiveness relationship with the Holy Spirit, experiencing all of the blessings of peace, grace, hope, victory, love, uh, the Holy Spirit within us, salvation, assurance, joy, all the things that he talked about in, in chapter 5. Paul's saying that this life is different than anything you've ever experienced. 
And it should be lived differently than you were living before. For the next three chapters, chapters 6, 7, and 8, Paul is going to, to describe the normal Christian life. He's going to describe for us what, what should be the normal Christian life. How we should live. How we should expect to live. Paul wants everyone to understand that we can and should live our lives as one delivered from sin. As one freed from sin. Freed from the bondage of sin. That we need not be, 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 taken, over or be taken over by it again. This new relationship with Jesus... This relationship that is based on faith ushers in for us a new normal. A new normal. It was normal before to sin. That's normal. I expect non-believers to sin. I expect people outside of a relationship with Jesus Christ to sin. I am not shocked when they do it. But believers, church, we have a new normal. And sin is not a part of it. We should be shocked when we sin. We should be shocked when another believer falls. But too often we're not. Because we live too close to the old normal. Paul is saying we're sanctified, we're set apart, we are removed from that. We are given a, a newness of life. Sin is no longer normal. Now righteousness through Christ is normal. And this starts with an understanding that in this new normal we have a new identification. In your sermon, out, uh, sermon outline in your notes, we have a new, number one is we have a new identification. We, we are not identified by the old way of life anymore. We, Sarah and Alex went in this week to, to get new driver's licenses for the state of Indiana. We all have Pennsylvania licenses and we, it's time to get a new ID. Uh, we're no longer, I don't even know what they call people from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvanians. Um, but we are Hoosiers now, once again. And so we need to, to have a, a card-carrying identification that tells people we are from Indiana. What we found out is that's not an easy process. <laughs> that we need two forms of identification proving that we actually are living in the state of Indiana. Well, we haven't gotten bills yet. So we, we don't have a proof of address yet. And so we have to wait to, to, to get this new identification. As believers, we have a new identification. That, that Paul, Paul asks a very important question. He says, if we have received this new life from Christ, can we keep on sinning? If we have stepped across this line of faith and if we've accepted uh, the forgiveness of God and we've accepted the, the righteousness of Christ, can we go back and continue to sin? And he says very plainly, by no means. By no means can you go on sinning. You have a new identification. You have a new way of life. There is not a chance you can go back to the old way. Why? Why? Because we died to sin. Look at what he says in Romans chapter 6 verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus. Were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death. In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father. We too may have a new life. If we've been united with him in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Understand that receiving God's free gift of justification, receiving what we, we read about in chapter 5, chapters 4 and chapter 5, that, that right standing with God means that while we, were, we are made alive in our spirit, we have died to some things. Some things we are to be dead to. 
You've heard some people say, I'm dead to you. It means you, you have no influence over my life anymore. I, I, to, to me, you are dead. That's, that's our new identification. Sin is dead to us. We are dead to sin. That our identification is not with Adam the sinner anymore. Our identif identification is with Christ the righteous. When people look at us, they must see Christ, not Adam. We have identified with Him. I, our, our identity is with Him. Paul says this identity with Christ, what this, what this new identification looks like is best illustrated through the act of baptism. Now if you've never been baptized, pay close attention. Because it is a, baptism is a significant step in solidifying our new identity. It, it, is, it is following Jesus in obedience. Baptism is, is that act of publicly declaring your new identity as a follower of Christ. Now it doesn't produce anything in us. It is simply an outward sign of, of the inward change that has already taken place. That we're not saved through baptism. We're saved by faith alone in Christ alone. But baptism is, is telling everyone I've got a new identity. It's proclaiming to the world that I'm different. That Christ has made me different. Now, we, verse, uh, verse 3 says, Don't you know that all of us were baptized into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into His death. Baptism is symbolic of identifying with Christ in His death. He died for us. And we died with Him. We believe in, in the alliance, we believe in baptism by immersion, meaning you're going to get completely under the water. You're going to get completely wet. There's no part of you that remains dry. It's that symbolicness of, of going all the way down and coming up in newness of life all the way new. Fully in his death, raised up to share in Christ's life that our new identification shares in Christ's resurrection to live. If we have been united with Him in His death, we will certainly also be united with Him in His resurrection. And that baptism is the perfect symbol of all of that. Of, of going down and into the grave and, 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 and dying with Christ and coming up to newness of life. Pay close attention to verse 6. Mark it in your Bibles, underline it, whatever you want to do to highlight it. It says, For we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be rendered powerless, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. <clears throat> the old self. We know that our old self. You know what that old self, that phrase actually refers to a corpse. That your old dead body that when sin comes looking, that's what it needs to find. A dead body, a corpse that has no life, that can't be poked, that can't be prodded, that can't be enticed. That sin is powerless. It is to, to be abolished. It is to be rendered unemployed. Otherwise, when sin shows up in your life, there's no work for it to do. You've made it unemployed. You've made it not a part of your life. You've rendered it useless, inactive. Our new identification with Christ renders sin ineffective in our life. We've been freed from the power of sin. It no longer has mastery over us. We no longer have to jump when it says jump. We no longer have to act. Why? Because we're dead to it. We've been given power to overcome sin, to say no when tempted. When, when sin shows up in your life, he no longer sees the Adam in you. Sin must see the Christ in you, that new identification that you wear. That new identification that says whose you are. So with this new identification comes second thing, a new reckoning. Because how do we make that happen? That sounds like a great idea that I'm dead, but I know in my experience I'm not always dead to sin. Sometimes sin still has mastery over me. So 
sometimes that, that ugly atom raises its head. So how do I do? How do I tap into that power? Look at verse, seven, or verse 11. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is another key verse. Underline it. Chapter 6, in lieu of underlining the entire chapter, because it's probably one of the most powerful chapters in the book of Romans, verse 6 and verse 11 are key. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. How do we experience the power over sin? Paul says right here, and I like the translations that say reckon. Reckon yourselves dead. Count yourselves dead. They say, if you, they say if you ever find yourself, and I've never tested this, and I hope never to have to test this. If you ever find yourself face to face with a bear, let's say you're walking down the street. Now, where we came from in Butler, Pennsylvania, it's happened on more than one occasion. There is a picture in the, uh, in the Butler Eagle, the newspaper, of a bear on the sidewalk in front of TJ Maxx. Just wandering through the parking lot in, in the mall. So if you ever find yourself come face to face with a bear, you know what to do? Don't turn and run. He will outrun you. Fall down, play dead. Do not move. They say he will come up, he will sniff you. He might even poke you. Play dead. And he will leave. Now that's good advice for a bear. But it's great advice for sin. That when temptation comes, play dead. Just fall down and play dead. When temptation hits you, play dead. Don't, it, it may poke you, it may prod you, it may look like it's going to be a great, great thing to do. Don't run. Count yourselves dead. Reckon yourself dead. Play dead to sin. The key to this whole power over the sin nature is, is in our considering ourselves dead when sin shows up. Because dead men don't sin. They just lay there. A corpse doesn't sin. And that word consider, that word reckon, count, means to count something as finished or complete. Sin is done. You are finished with sin. Consider yourselves, count yourselves, reckon yourselves complete when it comes to sin. It's over. And that verb carries, carries with it a continuous action. It's not a one time. It's, it's as often as you are tempted, count yourselves dead to sin. When temptation comes, drop and play dead. You see, sin is not dead. Sin is very much active. The enemy would like very much for you to continue to fall. He will continue to tempt. He will continue to bring things into your life that, causing you to, to want to sin, to, to kind of revive that old Adam, that corpse Adam in your life. Sin is not dead, but you are dead to sin. This is the new normal. Reckon it so. Count it as, as true. Consider it when you live. Remember King David? King David out on his roof one night and he's standing out there and he's looking over the city and he spots Bathsheba, this, this very beautiful young lady who, who's taking a bath on her rooftop that is below David's. And David can see her. And that wasn't abnormal. That was the place you took a bath. was up on the rooftop. And David walks over to his balcony and as he's looking over, he sees Bathsheba taking a bath. Temptation struck right then. But what King David did was not drop down and play dead. King David entertained the thought. And he saw her to be beautiful. And he continued to look. And he continued to think. And he realized he is king. He can have whatever he wants as king. And he wanted Bathsheba. And so he went and he sent for her. And she came and he made her one of his wives to find out that she was really already married to one of his soldiers in his army. And so what he did was he just had Bathsheba's husband Uriah sent to the front line 
knowing that he would be killed. And then he would take Bathsheba as his own. And he did. Temptation came and it reared his ugly head and he did not fall down and play dead. He gave in. Now take Joseph. Remember the story of Joseph? Good looking young Hebrew working for Potiphar, one of the most powerful men in Egypt. And he was put in, power, in Potiphar's house. And Potiphar's wife looked at this young good looking Hebrew and desired him. And on more than one occasion, occasion tried to coax him to sleep with her, to be with her. And he said no and eventually she, she cornered him. And what did he do? He fled. He played dead. He turned and got out of there. He left that temptation behind. Not got him into some trouble, but that was better than the trouble he would have gotten in had he followed through with it. When we reckon ourselves dead, as far as sin is concerned, we are corpses. That old, dead self. Consider yourselves dead. It doesn't mean that sin is destroyed but we continually put it out of business. We continually put it out. And you've been given the power to do that. Just reckon it so. Live within that power. That's the new normal. The new normal is that we never excuse sinful behavior in ourselves or anyone else. That we never expect ourselves to sin. We never excite sin. We, we avoid those tempting situations. We flee like Joseph did. We just don't put ourselves in that, in that spot. This means forming habits of righteousness. We, a new normal is a new lifestyle. Developing a deeper intimacy with God. One way to do this is, is through the practice of the spiritual disciplines. We form habits like prayer. Where that becomes a habit. That becomes a part of who we are. It's the new normal. We, we, we start habits like, like fasting. Personal study. Solitude. Spending time alone. Silence. Submission. Service. Confession. Worship. Community. Living life with, within the, the context of other believers. Because life was never meant to be lived alone. And let's be, let's be really honest. When we are alone is when sin comes knocking. It's when we're at our weakest. But when we live within community and we practice the discipline of, of having others around us to which we are accountable, knowing that we are never really alone, we have power over sin. The ability to conquer sin. That, that is dead to sin and alive to Christ. Paul tells us in verse 12 and 14, do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness. But rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And offer every part of yourself to Him as an instrument of righteousness. You see, sometimes in the old normal, we expected ourselves to sin. We just knew we were going to. Give me that situation, this is what I'm going to do. And sometimes in the new normal, we accept that as just the way I am. I just have that weakness and I know that I'm going to do that and, and you know, I do it and I confess. And I, you know, some people have even, it's just the way I am. It's just who I am. No, that's excusing sin. It's the way you were, but it's not the way you are to be. It's not what Christ died for, for you to go on sinning. And so we have to not only reckon ourselves, but then in order to do that, Paul says in these verses 12 and 14, that we need to have a new presentation of ourselves to God. We need to offer ourselves to God. Offer ourselves to righteousness. We present our bodies to Christ. We give ourselves all aspects of our life to Him. Who you are at work. Your new identification at work. The new normal. Kids at school. Your new identification. Living that out at school. 
living that out among friends, living that out in your neighborhood, then we need to offer ourselves, we need to present ourselves to Christ. We, we form those new habits and we make them a, a continuous part of our life. A refusal to allow sin to rule over us. It is a moment by moment striving to live like Christ. A refusal to obey sin, to be an instrument or a tool of wickedness. It's a determination in my life that I'm going to reckon the power that is mine. In my new identification, I am going to moment by moment present myself to Christ, not to sin. That we offer ourselves to God, to be used as an instrument of righteousness. That, that word offer means to place beside or near. Do you re see the, see the, 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 the picture here is that when we present ourselves to Christ, when we offer ourselves to Christ, we place ourselves beside Him or near Him. And the purpose we do that is to place a person or thing at one's disposal. We are placing ourselves next to Christ to be used by Him. As His instrument, as His tool, as His weapon. Because one of the things that we're going to be doing uh, in the near future is, is, we, is we begin to understand this, what it means to offer ourselves, not to sin anymore, but to God. Is that we're going to begin to unpack this clear vision for what Mac is all about. What this church is all about. What this church wants to be. Who we are. And the, the elders have done an incredible job over the last two years and me being able to just step in and enjoy the fruit of their labor with this clear vision of, of what we are to be. That there are five B's in a do. Five things that we want to be. As a, as a Christian, as a person of Mac, we want to be intimate with God. That means pulling up alongside. That means being near. That means presenting ourselves to Him. That means understanding Him in deeper ways. That means the spiritual disciplines lived out in our life. That we want to be intentional with others. Those that are around us. That we want to have an impact on, on those that we come in contact with. That we want to be servants in our, in our area of giftedness. That, that God is wanting to use us. Remember we, we said we're instruments, we're tools, we're weapons. Well, what kind of tool are we? What kind of instrument are we? What kind of weapon are we? How has God designed you? And, and what do, where do you fit in the ministry? Because we've all been given a service. We pull alongside and we make ourselves to His disposal. Our presentation is, is an act of service. Where do I serve the body? Where do I serve the world? Where do I serve this community? We want to be tellers of our grace story. We want to be able to, to tell others not just how we came to know Christ, but what God has done in our entire life up to, to right now. We want to be stewards of our resources that when we pull alongside and we present ourselves, we present everything. We present our time. We present that, those giftedness, our talents. We present our treasures, our, our financial resources. Those are all at God's disposal to use as He wants. We're just simply to be stewards. And then our due is we're, we're witnesses wherever we go. In our sphere of influence, in our, the, the people around us that we interact with every day. And verse 13 is key to all of that. Key to the vision of what we want Mac to become, what we want Mac to be. 13 is key. When he says, do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. That we can now be these things. A complete presentation of my life to God. I am at His disposal. My time is at His disposal. My talents, my abilities are at His disposal. My treasure, my finances, my money is at His disposal. We're instruments. God is building His church and we are the tools that He is using to build it. God is fighting that cosmic battle of good versus evil, of truth versus a lie, and, and our lives are the weapons that He is using to fight that battle. 
come alongside. We present ourselves to him. We, we, we make ourselves at his disposal for his use. Folks, this is the good news of Romans. This is where, this is where the party starts to happen. This is where the excitement and the power begins to show itself because today you have a new identity. A new identification as a follower of Christ. And you need to reckon yourselves dead to sin. Is there sin that still has breath in your life? Is there a sin that still you let live? You don't completely choke the life out of it? And you think, well, it's just the way it is. We all have some area. Kill it. <laughs> I can't say it any other way. Kill it. Destroy it. Set it to Christ. Give it to Christ. Allow the, the power that, that He has given us in this new identification to reckon ourselves dead to it. It has no power over you unless you give it power. Unplug it. When it shows its ugly head, when that temptation comes, drop and play dead. It finds no life in you. No power in you. And the more times you do it, the more dead you are to it. And eventually the bear walks away. And then you get up and you live. Victorious over the bear. Reckon it so. Present yourself to God as an instrument, a tool to be used to build His church and a weapon to defeat the enemy. This morning the worship team is going to come back up and we're going to end with a time of celebration, a time of victory because that's what, that's what this morning was all about. The power that is ours. Reckon it so. This morning we want to, we want to celebrate this new identity. We want to celebrate the, this power that is within us. That Christ has given us to overcome. And this morning when we sing these last two or three songs. I want you in your heart of hearts. In the way back parts of your mind. To claim that new identity. To reckon it so. To experience the victory that is ours. Father we come this morning. Many of us still struggling with areas that we've not completely killed. Areas of our life that we have not completely put to death. Lord, I pray in these next few moments that we in the power of this new identification, we in the power of this, this identification with Christ, that we would reckon it so. Father, that we would, we would leave here in newness of life in the power to live the Christ life. Father, the victorious life, that we would be, be more than conquerors. Father, help us to come alongside, to present ourselves to you this morning, fully. That your Holy Spirit would, would fill us completely to overflowing. Father, we will leave different than we came in. In the power of the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Love is mighty and so much stronger.